All right, so what we've seen in the previous video is that the instantaneous velocity can be defined in terms of a limiting process, and we call that derivative mathematically. So what we'll do now is study three examples of very simple motion where we can actually take the derivative very explicitly. Okay, so what we've seen is that the, if I give you the position x of t of an object as a function of t, then we define its velocity as being the limit of the average velocity, where I send the two times here, t1 and t, to be very, very close to each other. So let's calculate that in three very simple cases. Okay, my first case is uh, the following. So x of t here describes the motion of an object as a function of t, and it turns out to be given by just a constant horizontal line. So if I have an object, say, cup of Tim Hortons here, the motion here is just this. Nothing's moving. So that's pretty boring. So mathematically, this function is just given by x of t be equal to constant. Now, if I ask you what the velocity of this object is, well, object's not moving. So clearly, you know right away that the velocity should be equals to zero. Now, our definition better agree with that because we know that this is the correct answer. So let's calculate first the average velocity. So if I choose two points, t, t1 here, have corresponding positions x of t and x of t1. And if I calculate the average velocity, this is just a difference in position over the difference in time. But both positions are exactly the same, x0 minus x0, t1 minus t. So I get big old zero. And in fact, this is the average velocity, but the instantaneous velocity is just the same, because even if I take the limit where I send t1 to be very close to t, well, I still get zero, because zero doesn't depend on t1 and t. In other words, the velocity here is constant. So it's always going to be equal to zero. Okay, it's a pretty simple case. Now there's one observation I want to make here, is that actually zero is the slope of the function x of t. Indeed, x of t is in the horizontal line, so its slope is zero. Now that could just be a coincidence, right? Zero is equal to zero. But it turns out that it won't be, as you'll see. So the velocity always has something to do, it has something to do with the slope of the position, or more generally the tangent line, as we'll see. Okay, let's look at a more complicated example, where the position here is described by an increasing line. So physically what's happening is that my cup of Tim Hortons here is actually moving at a constant rate. Right. So mathematically, I would write the function here as being x of t is equal to x0 plus v0 times t, where x and v0, x0 and v0 are constants. Now, if I ask you what the velocity is, well, if you look at it, what you know is that the velocity here is constant. So just by thinking about it, you don't really know exactly what constant it should be, but it surely should be constant because the object, the position of the object is increasing linearly. So let's calculate what the velocity is. So again, I choose my two points, t and t1, I have corresponding positions x of t, x of t1. So I first calculate the average velocity as being the difference in position over the difference in time. So x of t1 here is just x0 plus v0 t1 x of t is just x0 plus v0 times t over t1 minus t. Now, some magic going on, x0 cancel, and the two terms here I can factor out a v0, and then I get t1 minus t, which will cancel with a t1 minus t. So what I get is just v0, which is indeed a constant. So my intuition was correct. The average velocity is constant. In fact, here as well, the instantaneous velocity is just the same as the average velocity, it's just v0 again, because v0 doesn't depend on t1 and t, so it doesn't matter whether I send t1 to be close to t. In other words, the velocity here is constant, so average velocity and instantaneous velocity are the same. And my observation here, quite surprisingly maybe, still holds, so v0 is the slope of x of t. So maybe it's not a coincidence after all, maybe it is true that the derivative has something with the slope of x of t. Okay, let's look at a more complicated example, where the position is described by this nice-looking curve. So physically, my cup of Tim Hortons is moving, but it's moving faster and faster. Right? So mathematically, I would write that as x of t. So this particular curve is described by the equation x0 
plus v naught times t plus one half a naught times t square, where x naught, v naught, and a naught are all constants here. Now, if I ask you what the velocity should be, now it's not so obvious. What we know is that whoop, my cup is going faster and faster, so the velocity should be increasing. But the exact equation for the velocity is not so obvious to deduce just from thinking about the physics. So let's calculate it. So we'll start with the average velocity. Do the exact same calculation as before. Take two points, corresponding positions, and calculate the average velocity. So I have x of t1, so here it's a pretty long equation, something like this, minus x of t, which is also quite long, and I divide the whole thing by t1 minus t, but now I have some great cancellations again. x0 cancels with x0. The v0 term here I can factor. I get t1 minus t, which cancels, so I get v0 plus the remaining terms, which is 1 half a0 times t1 square minus t square divided by t1 minus t. But I'm not done yet. I can simplify this further because I can see that the numerator here is really just the product of t1 minus t and t1 plus t. Still dividing by t1 minus t. So these two terms cancel. And my average velocity is just v0 plus 1 half a0 times t1 plus t. Now there's something interesting compared to the two other cases, which is that the average velocity is not constant anymore. It depends on t1 and t. And we expect that because the object is accelerating here. So if I take a longer time interval, then I expect the average velocity to be greater than if I take a very short time interval. In other words, the average velocity should depend on the time interval that I choose because uh, the velocity is not constant. Now, if I want to calculate the instantaneous velocity, what I should do is basically take the limit, which means that I'm going to send t1 to be very, very close to t. Practically, or mathematically, what that means is in this equation, we're only going to replace t1 by t. So we'll see how to define this limit mathematically rigorously in the next few weeks. But for now, let's just do that heuristically. So I'm just going to replace t1 by t, what I'll get is v0 plus 1 half times a0 times 2t. So the 2s will cancel, and I'll get a0 times t. And I claim that this is now the instantaneous velocity for the motion of this particular object, which I think you've probably seen in your physics course before. If you have an object which is moving with constant acceleration, this is its position, this is its velocity, and the acceleration is just a0 here. So it is all consistent with the definition of velocity as being the derivative of the position function. And quite interestingly here, my observation is slightly different. So I cannot say now that the velocity is the slope of the position function because it's not a line. But what I can say is that if I draw a particular line, which we call the tangent line, so this is the line that barely touches the curve at the point t. So if I draw this line, then what we'll see, and we'll study that in more detail, is that the velocity is the slope of the tangent line at t. This is a very important statement. In fact, it generalizes the statement of the last two examples, where x of t was a constant line. Here it's not a constant line, but the velocity is related to the slope of the tangent line. And this will be true in general, as we'll see. For an arbitrary function, x of t, if I take the derivative, I will always calculate the slope of the tangent line. We'll study that in more detail in the next few videos.